Well, I don't think there's any sugarcoating this. The back end of the Astros starting rotation has been plain bad. Christian Javier, Hunter Brown, Jose Arquiti, who has been uh, giving you long relief, uh, just not good. I know Dusty loves his vets and guys with experience and playoff experience, but there's no way any of those three guys can get a start ahead of J.P. France in the playoffs, right? Well, there's a way, and you pretty much alluded to it, but as a practical matter, no. Though J.P. France had been shelled in two of his three prior starts to Sunday against the Padres, and while it worked out all right, he was wild, his bugaboo in the minors. He walked five guys in six innings. The Padres, having packed it in, sat both Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis Jr., so he was facing a you know skeleton squad lineup. Uh, but uh, Javier and Brown have been ongoing disasters for months now. Uh, I had a, an exer, is that how we refer to this now? <laughs> uh, inquire, you know, would it be so bizarre for the Astros to give a start to Spencer Araghetti? who's fared pretty well uh, at AAA, generally going no deeper than five innings, six here or there. But over five, I think it's five of his last six starts, he's only given up more than one earned run once. Javier's been so bad. And if he goes okay, then he gives up one monster inning. Hunter Brown's just been terrible. We're talking ERAs over five and six over double-digit starts, lengthy stretches of the schedule. So against the A's or the Royals this week, if you wanted to take a look and maybe you run into something with Araghetti, you know, hitters who see a, a pitcher for the first time, it's considered advantage pitcher. Uh, there is some history of September call-ups actually making a difference in October. A guy named Marty Bystrom with the Phillies went 5-0 and in September in 1980. Uh, relievers like K-Rod with the Angels, Todd Worrell with the Cardinals anyway. But that's how bad Javier and Brown have been and Urquidy, you know, whether he's coming in in situations, I'm not starting the game. It's usually a blowout game. He's not focused. Well, he's pitching for his opportunity, so damn well should be focused. He's just been terrible. And where I want to stretch this out as you raise the subject, it's why winning the division, I mean, anything can happen, best out of three, best out of five, best out of seven. But in giving yourself the best chance, it's that much more imperative that the Astros lock down this division. Because if you get in as a wild card and you have to play that two out of three, well, you're pitching Fromber and Verlander, and I would go in that order. I won't stretch out why there, but uh, they're going games one and two, meaning neither of them is available until at least game three of the division series, unless you're going to start someone on three days rest, which actually is why I would go Fromber in game one, so you could come back on short days rest if you're down in the uh, division series. You know, a, lot of, a lot of ground to cover before we get there. Uh, but you want to avoid that two out of three, so you're not using Fromber and Verlander. Even if you sweep the two, they're not available at the outset of the division series, no way in hell you're thinking, oh, we're in good shape with Hunter Brown or Jose or Keedy uh, or Christian Javier uh, really starting any game. Uh, but one of them would have to start a, a game four, uh, presumably anyway, unless the Astros are going to tempt the fates, the track record of starters on short rest in the postseason. Not real good, but I think at this stage of their careers, Fromber would be the better option on three days rest than Verlander. Yeah, that that makes a ton of sense. My focus is going to be this next Hunter Brown start after Fromber and Verlander against the A's. We know how bad Javier has been, but look at this with Hunter Brown. In his last seven starts, a 7.20 ERA with 24 earned runs in his last 30 innings. 24 earned runs in his last 30 innings. I mean, holy crap. Like that that's just a non-starter right there. Javier is with a 621 ERA in his last seven games. Still awful, but it's better than what Hunter Brown's bringing to the table, and at least he's got a little more experience. But you don't feel good about either one of those guys. Arquiti, 664 ERA in last seven games. I mean, this is just not Astros baseball. That We're not used to this, but I like Charlie's advice there on how they should set up the rotation if they're lucky enough to win the division. But... I mean, you pick your poison. I think I take Javier over Hunter Brown right now, unless we see something from Hunter in his next start here in a couple of days. Yeah, that's where you, whoever you go with is your starting pitcher. Your bullpen's warming up during the national anthem. Yes. Uh, and if you get deep starts from Verlander and Fromber, you can almost choose to turn one into a, a bullpen game uh, at the first sign of trouble. Uh, but at this point, how could it not be JP France as your number three option? Well, with the with the offense doing what it's doing, that certainly relieves a little bit of pressure. But we're basically saying that unless you get prime Justin Verlander and prime Fromber Valdez, 
this team's playoff hopes look a little sketchy. Uh, they're they're going to, I would feel like, inordinately rely on uh, those two guys and the offense to kind of pick them up because you can't really count on anything in the back end of the rotation. They're just another quality contender at this point. This is not a great team because the starting pitching after the top two is just nowhere close to what we've seen through most of this dynastic run. Uh, the bullpen's still very good. I mean, Presley's not automatic, but is solid. Brian Abreu has been automatic for over a month now and given up a run in that stretch. Hector Neris is excellent. Uh, Montero back from the dead over the last six weeks. Uh, the loss of Stanek is a bummer, but you know you lose your number five or number six reliever. Right, Maton hasn't been real good for a while. Their bullpen still runs with anyone. The rotation, not so much, but step back. Right, We judge the Astros against the Astros standards, extraordinarily high standards. The Orioles are quite clearly the best team in the American League this year. Look at their rotation. Who are you saying would be their, oh, surefire game one starter, game two? Who has three or four starters that you're saying, that's money? Nobody, right? The Rays, with all their injuries, and they still mix in opener games. Uh, The Minnesota Twins in a short series, you know, they have multiple solid starters, but not three or four that are making you say, are we going to score four runs uh, against those guys? Uh, The Rangers, obviously, are a mess. Uh, the Mariners, I don't think of Castillo as a grade A number one. I say he's a number one, and they have good depth and young pitching, but none of them really postseason proven. So uh, the Astros has measured against the Astros over the last six years, not as good, but still good enough to win the World Series, but much more capable of not getting back to the American League Championship Series. And that's one thing I want to focus on as we come down the stretch run is I want to see Yiner Diaz catching when it, when it's Javier, when it's Hunter Brown. You know, we had Dusty with those quotes the other day, like, oh, Yiner and Hunter, they, they just can't seem to get through the fifth inning. We're going to get Maldi in there. If if Maldi can't straighten him out, I, you know, you know, Maldi's the one that could straighten him out if he can get straightened out. I don't buy that. I think you need more offense. And the other reason, it's not calling the game that's getting these guys lit up. It's that they can't hit their spots, and they're wild. They're wild in the strike zone. They're wild walking people. Some of the stuff isn't quite what it was. That's not just, oh, we should have called a curveball there, not a fastball. And that's what I've been looking at with Javier all year. I've been upset that he's been up in the zone and so predictable. He doesn't know where his fastball is going. And when that's the case, you're just hoping you get it over the plate. A catcher helping you call a better game is it's not really going to do anything if you can't accomplish and execute your game plan. I mean, in the Padre series, if Maldi hadn't been catching, how badly would Hunter Brown have sucked Friday night? How big an <laughs> inning would Javier have given up Saturday night if Maldi wasn't there to settle things down and impart his genius? Hunter Brown was brilliant in April, right? The way he flashed last year and then in April in the video match, he's a Verlander doppelganger. Well, uh, Yonder Diaz was Hunter Brown's catcher in April. And then Dusty in May, well, I need to acclimate Maldonado because what if the younger guy who's not overweight and is better, what if he gets hurt? I have to have Maldi uh, associated with catching Hunter Brown. I'm not saying it's direct cause and effect, but from May on, Hunter Brown overall has been an incompetent starting pitcher with Maldonado as his primary catcher over those four months. So, hey, Dusty's in the saddle of a team that's going back to the postseason, almost certainly, and could wind up winning back-to-back World Series, it doesn't mean that tactically he's distinguishing himself. On the bullpen, you you brought it up, Charlie. Uh, Graveman couldn't make it out of his last appearance. Uh, had to be lifted. Hector Neris inherits bases loaded one out, gets out of it. Earlier this year, we saw uh, Neris inherit bases loaded no outs, got out of it. Hector Neris has been a perennial leverage guy for Dusty Baker in this bullpen. His contract's up after this year. This is a contract year for him. The the Astros spent a lot of money to sign, well, I mean, relatively a lot of money for the output on Rafael Montero. Uh, Do you think they should be ponying up a similar amount to be able to keep a guy as important as Hector Neris in this bullpen? Neris is 34. I'd be leery about going three years, right? Montero younger, but with a lesser overall track record than Hector Neris. Uh, you never know when a guy will hit the wall. Neris has also been wonderfully durable over the course of his career at Phillies and uh, has answered the bell whenever uh, asked his time with the Astros. Um, you know, if it's three years, 30 million or so, 
The way the Astros are making money hand over fist, maybe as high as number three in revenues in all Major League Baseball. Um, I don't think I'm going to scrimp on on bringing back Naris. Yeah, I I will say that you do have some money committed to people. You got Montero on the books for about eleven million bucks next year. Kendall Graveman is going to be eight million dollars, which is actually kind of a bargain. So we'll see what they're willing to go there, how much they want to invest in their bullpen. But yeah, Naris has been fantastic. But we talk about this all the time with relief pitchers. It can be kind of an every other year thing. We're seeing that with Montero this year. So I would like to see Naris back, but that is a lot of money to commit to your bullpen. Luckily with the Brayu, you're not having to pay him a whole lot right now. Yeah, can probably try to trade Graveman if you choose only one year left at the $8 million. Uh, if there's a market for Mil- Phil Maton over $5 million per year, the Astros probably – uh, let him go as well and and sign cheaper or uh, Seth Martinez or someone else within the system can be that last guy uh, out of the pen. Uh, again, uh, you know, if when you're talking about your bullpen, you're fretting about the number five or number six arm in it, you're in pretty good shape. 